first I'm going to go back for our first uh, gen sum of this semester. So I hope you had a restful and regenerative uh, break for this year. And we're looking forward to another great semester with you uh, this go round. Uh, before we get started, I also wanted to, uh, Mary would ask me to give you a reminder that today is the deadline for early bird registration for PAA. So if you're going to PAA, you have until mid February to sign up without getting kicked off the program. But today is the deadline for signing up at a lower fee that costs you less money. So uh, strong recommendation to talk to Mary when you get registered if you haven't registered uh, for PAA already. Um, so today, it's my pleasure to introduce Adela Matters, who is coming to us from the University of North Carolina. Working with an assistant professor of geography and a fellow of the Carolina Population Center. And um, he has an incredibly impressive array of research, I think, and stopped counting at around 70 peer reviewed articles and a 10 year lab of his PhD, which is a founder, uh, published across a range of the top uh, public health journals. So, uh, I'm thinking about epidemiology and work in general about epidemiology, journal mm -hmm. and pediatrics. And then also the sort of classic spatial uh, places like right health and place as well. Uh, so his work is really applying a lot of spatial analysis methods to thinking about um, sort of heterogeneity and access to the healthcare and utilization of healthcare and also thinking about um, sort of the differential impacts of state level health policy on health outcomes. A large part of his current research is really focusing on uh, vaccination rates and thinking about how that translates to kind of herd immunity and spatial variation in these processes. And we're really excited to welcome you here to our conference today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. It, you know, I just like do my work. And then when I get introduced like that, I'm like, wow, I've been busy for a while. Uh, so I'm I'm really excited to be here and and in person I I really haven't made any trips since March of 2020 so I'm like let out of the house and and excited to to actually travel here I'm glad that uh, Wisconsin obliged and, and gave me the coldest weather I've experienced since I left Michigan uh, for my visit so um, so I'm gonna talk to you guys today about uh, work I've been doing um, on a K award I received right as the COVID pandemic started. I literally got the notice of award about a week before we got sent home uh, in, at the end of February of 2020. And thinking about how I can leverage my training and my knowledge and my skills in geography and working with spatial data to help us understand this like real world outcome of herd immunity and how to understand kind of how uh, infections transmit uh, within and among people at these larger kind of population scales. So I'm gonna start um, going way back, uh, but I, I really wanna talk about infectious disease in the US and how I landed on this, um, this area of study. Uh, before COVID, um, I was at George Mason University right out, right out of my PhD after doing a short postdoc, and a professor in health policy walked in and said, I have this childhood vaccination data. I'm waving my hand like he's actually got a piece of paper, but he, he, had, he had found school-level vaccination data for California. He was really interested in wondering um, about geographic variation in uptake of childhood vaccines and of parents who decide not to vaccinate their, their children. Um, and at the time, our concerns were lagging vaccination rates for childhood uh, uh, infections like measles and pertussis or whooping cough. Um, and this kind of slow but steadily rising increase in vaccine hesitancy that at the time in like 2014-ish um, had been happening for about 10 to 15 years, just a little bit of, of vaccine hesitancy, more parents choosing to, to not vaccinate their children. Um, and I was like, oh, this is so amazing. And I can't believe that this is happening considering vaccines are so good and we've had them for so long. And so I started doing a little work into this and it turns out this, this article is from the Scientific American in 1884, actually. And the, and the quote is, uh, that there are still intelligent people who oppose vaccination and strive to make it appear that it is not only useless, but injurious. Uh, this need surprise no one acquainted with the vagaries of the human mind. Uh, but I put this up here 
because they, you know, a lot of this feels very modern, um, the, the hesitancy and some of the blowback against this, you know, this very effective and proven public health intervention, uh, but it's not. It's as long as there's been public health interventions, in this case, vaccination, there has been people who are against it and hesitant. Um, so we're studying it kind of in the modern environment um, and in the modern kind of uh, ability to communicate through social media and in a connected world. Uh, and I think that that's what we're seeing now is, is a different amount of um, kind of uh, ability to get this information out and the way we share information being different. And then this, this you know, this is again pre-COVID. This is from 2017. Um, I don't know if you guys saw Peter Hotez. He's been on the news a lot talking about COVID vaccination and stuff. But this was in 2017, him talking about the anti-vaxxers are, are winning um, because they're like turning more people over, kind of increasing hesitancy. And in, then, and in this case, um, it's mostly, again, talking about childhood childhood vaccines. So as you know, we um, have been living through a pandemic and uh, this has reached kind of um, another level of intensity, I think, with the COVID vaccine. Um, this idea of distrust of vaccines seems to have been amplified, um, you know, since the vaccine came out. And I've been, I mean, thinking about how that relates to our current society with political polarization. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going on and why it's going on. I just know that I look at vaccination uptake rates of the COVID-19 vaccine, and I am literally appalled at how low they are all over the place. Um, and you can see this was just, this was literally from was it January 24th? I had a different uh, uh, example here, but I was just doing a little looking right before I I, uh, I came to give this talk. Um, and there was, you know, this, this story in Rolling Stones about claims of vaccine injuries and deaths, you know, people protesting more and more. And then here, um, here's so Elon Musk tweeting about, um, does this one, this one have a pointer? Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, saying he had major side effects of his second booster. He felt like he was dying. Hopefully no permanent damage, but I don't know. This is the like sowing of the of the distrust and the uncertainty about it. And then he also replied about his cousin who has a serious case of myocarditis. Her my, myocarditis had to go to the hospital. Um I used to use a, a tweet example of Trump from before he was president because he was another person that kind of sowed this distrust of vaccines in this way that's like, I don't know, you know, to their, their millions and millions of followers who don't really, I don't think, kind of maybe understand the joke sometimes or understand how they're providing information. But this is the the world we're living in, and this is the the kind of the context for for which I'm thinking about herd immunity and this idea um, that vaccination and immunity from an infection it doesn't just protect the individual, but at some point it when enough people are immune that those that don't have immunity can be protected indirectly by the presence of all those people who are immune. And this is achieved via high levels of immunity, which we can either um, get to those high levels via vaccination uh, and mass vaccination programs or by infection. And the way that kind of herd immunity just works under the hood is that it is an interruption of transmission of disease, of these chains that link from person to person because it gets stopped as the infection's moving throughout a population, it gets stopped like a barrier by people who are immune, right? And so it cannot transfer from person to person. Um, and so in a way, the people with immunity, immunity are then shielding those without immunity, right? And why this is so important is this is how we as a society protect the truly vulnerable people that 
cannot be vaccinated. Or people, my colleague, Tim Leslie, um, here, I'm, I'm doing a HIPAA violation right now. He has been vaccinated for pertussis multiple times. It just He just never has developed immunity. And so Tim gets pertussis. He gets whooping cough every few years. Herd immunity is, is basically our society's way of protecting people such as Tim or people who may have true allergies to vaccination, so the, the ingredients in the vaccines. Um, and what we've, maybe you've heard about in this is, you know, a lot of people are kind of relying on herd immunity that aren't so vulnerable now because they don't want to take the vaccine. And some parents are using this concept for the, the childhood uptake. Um, they're using this idea to say like, oh, well, my child is not at risk because everyone else at my school should be vaccinated, right? Um, the problem is when everyone's, there are lots of people, lots of parents are thinking that, oh, I don't need to vaccinate my child because everyone else is. Then you get places like I study in California, some schools that, you know, only half the kindergartners have their polio vaccine when they, they show up for kindergarten. Um, which is like pretty scary stuff, to be honest. Uh, so this this concept, though, is was as a geographer was just like amazingly interesting to me as I started digging into this idea of well, how do we like capture this? How do we measure this? What does this look like? And um, I don't know like how many other epidemiologists are in the room other than some I met earlier. But I started looking into the epi literature about herd immunity, and I found out there was like, it's a very like mathematical uh, type idea. It exists kind of in models. And then it also exists in public health messaging and vaccination plans. Um, and it's like, oh, we've got to get to 70% because that's what the mathematical model says we have to get to, to reach herd immunity. And there's not, I mean, there's been, I, I'm like being somewhat like, you know, flippant about this. There, there's there been a ton of work on herd immunity and, and, and the people have done a very good job. But what I found is there's, there's not a ton of like kind of really applied and usable information about it, especially thinking about herd immunity on like a population scale or about like, how do we actually use this? Like, can I use zip code level data to tell me about herd immunity in my population or it, should I be thinking of this at a state level or a county level? And I'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, let's look at how herd immunity works. I have some slides I built a few years ago. Um, literally placed every single one of these little uh, virtual people. Um, a lot of copy paste, but I think it was worthwhile because I've used these slides about 50 times over my life thus far. Uh, so, so let's talk about what disease transmission looks like in a population with no immunity. Everyone is healthy, everyone's susceptible, and we introduce um, uh, four people in, with infection inside this larger population. And then I've basically just run my little simulation here forward two steps and everyone gets infected around this original people and it just goes and goes and everyone gets infected right? Pretty straightforward. When we have moderate immunity in a population, so now we have some people that started in this blue state. So we have green people who are susceptible, blue people who are immune. And then we, again, we introduce infected people into the population. And you can see we still have disease spread and some people still get infected, right? But we have like this whole region, like down here, and again, I'm already talking about regions because I'm a geographer uh, and this looks like a map um, of all those people that actually never got infected, at least in those first couple of steps, even though they are susceptible, they weren't infected. This is this idea of herd immunity starting to work here, right? There is a protection happening for this group of people that is basically made by this group of people and all these other people that decided to get vaccinated in this little model, right? So now we crank this up to 90% and we spread out all the unvaccinated people because in this case, we're talking about people with real like medical issues and, and it is quite rare to be allergic to a vaccine or to be able to not be vaccinated. And you can see we introduce 
right, are for infections and they can't spread. They can't go anywhere. And everyone else who was not imported in a, as an infection here is, is protected. And that's herd immunity working right there. They shielded off these, um, these vulnerable members of our uh, society. So the two things that really, I really started thinking about when I started thinking about herd immunity were who is the herd in herd immunity? Because no matter how much I read and looked and tried to find, I could not find any accepted definition of herds, of how epidemiologists would, would tell someone in geography, this is how you kind of group people together to call it a herd for use in like a study on herd immunity. Okay. So I found, cause it was all, it's like when I said it exists as a mathematical model, it just kind of does exist as a mathematical model and as these kind of um, theoretical populations. And then the next thing that I really started thinking about, again, as a geographer and thinking about scale of, of observations and how we aggregate data and, and things like that, is what size is a useful for public health purposes, for disease surveillance, you know, and monitoring of infections. Um, so what size uh, is useful or appropriate then for epidemiology that then still the math still works, you know, we're still able to use this as models. So what is useful or appropriate for a herd for understanding herd immunity and estimates from it? And what I came to understand, and this is my current estimate, is it's somewhere between a household and a state. No, I'm just joking. I just say there's like really no, um, th this is not a question that people who work on herd immunity have grappled with. They, it's just really hasn't been there. Um, there has, from what I've seen, been kind of a disconnect between the, the mathematical theoretical epidemiologists that, that work on the herd immunity models and the public health practitioners and the people like geographers like myself who do this in an applied sense. Well, how do we use this to help us understand about the world and what's going on? Um, and so, you know, that's where I thought was super interesting about herd immunity itself, because as a geographer, here's again, our 90% vaccinated. This is not when you, when you factor in how people act in the way that our society works, this is not what a 90% vaccinated map looks like. This is what a 90% vaccinated map looks like, where we have clusters of people who are not vaccinated. Just because, you know, we tend to live in and around people who are like us, and there are decisions we make because our friends are making them and our interactions and things. So then, in this case, when we introduce the infection in the same four people, now we have these mini outbreaks here and here because we have these clusters of unvaccinated people, right? And this was very easy for me to see when I was like making my first maps of the California data that my friend walked into my department um, with. I was like, wow, this really varies. And wow, there is some definite spatial patterns going on that like, Schools that have low uptake in vaccination tend to be near other schools with low uptake for vaccination, um, which means likely those kids are all playing together in the, in the communities and things like that. Uh, and so this is, again, what's driven a lot of my work, thinking about um, kind of this is what the mass is often considering when we're thinking about herd immunity but this is often what the world looks like when we're, we're trying to understand what's going on in, in the world. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about um, how I'm approaching this study and kind of why I made some of the decisions I did. Um, and this is a, a basic outline of, of the research part of my K award. Um, the, the K Award, for those of you who uh, who haven't heard of this, is is an award where you you get um, you get funds to do both research, but you also get funds to do additional training. 
And so I, um, all my degrees are in geography and I, you know, work in a geography department and all my training has been in geography and everything I've picked up in epidemiology and public health has just been from working with other people and reading about it. So in my K award, my training is mostly about epidemiology and about modeling infectious diseases. Um, and then, so I've spent a lot of time, I've actually, it's fun, I get to go on the you know other side of the desk and I've been sitting in some classes over the last couple of years and going to lots of workshops and things like that. Um, but uh, the research part of this, uh, I broke into three parts. The first part is um, to construct an agent-based model to, to build my model such that I can reconstruct the pandemic. Oh, I have to, I forgot one other thing um, that then I'll come back later. Was when I proposed this work, I was, uh, I proposed for studying measles in California uh, in school-age children. Again, like I said, I, I got my notice of a word literally right at, at the end of February of 2020. And so I basically pivoted all my work to studying COVID. Um, and to, to to basically change my my study population and, and who I was looking at, um, so and because I live in North Carolina, I had some um, inside pathways to some data to data there. So I I um, I'm looking at North Carolina and COVID spread in North Carolina. So so part one of this is to build my agent based model so I can reconstruct the pandemic, and this is a really important part of any kind of how to study herd immunity because you can't basically set up an experiment and not vaccinate some people and vaccinate some people. It's like an unethical, it's like it's it's unethical way to do research. Um, so there are only, uh, the only way we can really study these are like observational studies of people who have decided not to get vaccinated. Um, if we can find the right populations, uh, to do that, um, which that's not kind of the work kind type of work that I do. Um, but I thought that, well, the modeling capabilities and the computing power that are available to us now, maybe I can actually do this with agent-based models because we can assign the agents, and I'll talk about today how I'm setting this model up. Um, we can assign agents uh, conditions and behaviors, and we can give rules about what the world, kind of how we think the rule world works, let it go and see how well our model does. Do we have a kind of a an accurate-ish or good characterization of what's happening in the world? The one I'm going to show you uh, that I'm using is an individual model um, such that every agent in my model represents one human being which allows me then to do these kind of studies where I can have experiments, where I can do things like say, all right, let's only vaccinate half the population in my model population. And, you know, I don't go to jail for doing terrible, you know, unethical research, right? So I, I could, it allows me to do that. So it's, it's interesting. I, I had an in interesting conversation about this this morning about like, you know, how do you study something like herd immunity when there's no way to set up kind of a, a true experiment there are very limited natural experiments that are appropriate or even get you kind of near it. Um, and they all have their limitations or like models, which again, like as much as I love my, my little agents and my model, they're not real people. And I have to convince um, reviewers, I have to convince everyone that my modeled environment is capturing uh, the real world in, in such a way that we can use it to ask these kind of questions, right? So, um, so that's part one. Part two is really thinking about how we capture interactions among regions uh, and who actually comes into contact with who when we think on a little broader scale of, of not like, you know, us people in this room today, but when we look at units such as zip codes, or I'm going to show you results from sense block groups. And we think like, well, who do we actually come into contact kind of on a regular basis outside of our homes? Uh, and then part three is, is using this information to, to study herd immunity. So the first part is uh, talking about um, 
SID and C. I have a, a, a PhD student who's finishing uh, this semester and she makes me name models and I hate naming models. I like hate doing the acronym thing, but she's like, you have to, or else no one will ever find it. No one will ever like care about your model. I relented um, and I called this the simulator of infectious disease dynamics in North Carolina or SID NC. Rachel approved. She was very happy. She thought that was that was a good um, model name. So instead of building my own agent-based model where I have to like program in all the interactions and, and how this works, I actually built it using um, another group from Pittsburgh who got funded on this big NIH grant called Midas multiple years ago. It was all about just modeling. And they built a platform for agent-based modeling. So it's like they give you the tools, they give you the model, like models, but also the set of tools to like make it your own. Um, so I have their modeling platform. It's supposed to make it easy, but here I am still a year and a half working and tinkering and, and still playing with the model because there's so much to do on it. Um, the nice thing about this model that they built is uh, they worked with people that actually right down the street from me, um, RTI, which is Research Triangle International, uh, who built a synthetic version of the U.S. population, an individual level version of the U.S. population from census data where everyone is assigned to households um, and households have like true structure, like demographic structure, like they didn't just grab the people out of the, the census block group and randomly threw them into households. They actually spent a bunch of time trying to reconstruct this in a way that made sense. Um, and they have this really nice database that fits right into the model. So I didn't also didn't have to like build this individual level data set. So lots of benefits to using this. So in my model, I have all these agents. They have an age, a sex, a race, a household, a school or work location. Um, and these, there are more attributes. So everything I'm gonna show you about my model just like this is like the surface. There's probably 10 times as much underneath it as well. Um, they Agents in the model, the way that uh, they do interaction, which is really quite cool, is um, every agent spends a certain amount of time at home in their home environment every day. Age appropriately, they either go to school or work or some like uh, older agents don't go to work, they're retired, um, and then spend a little bit of time in their neighborhood every evening where they interact with people who live in their geographic region. So this is people interacting in their household. This is people interacting at school or work, where, which is also broken down into like a school and then classrooms. Um, and then this is just geographic neighbors for each other. Uh, which is nice because then it allows you to like kind of set those things and have some agents go here and there and, and other places and you can a lot of control over transmission. And these agents all have conditions and some of the condition, one of the conditions is their infection status for SARS-CoV-2 for um, COVID, right? But they also have these conditions that determine their behaviors and different states and, um, or, um, these different like parts of the agent. And I'll show you an example of this, um, of what the model looks or what these conditions are. So this is a, a SARS-CoV-2 model and these are all different modules. And so these are all different conditions that the agents have. And I have a condition for like isolation that determines whether an agent isolates once they, based on their infection status, it determines whether they pull themselves out of school or um, out of their neighborhood. And that's like probable, it's based on probabilities, right? So there's like a 80% a, a chance that when someone gets a, uh, a symptomatic and co has symptomatic COVID, they pull themselves out of their school um, and their neighborhood. And then there's a module for testing that determines like the probability of someone based on their infection status that they're going to actually get a test that day. And then I have a module that determines how long it's been since they were actually exposed to COVID, whether they test positive or negative. Um, again, these are all based on probabilities. 
I have a cool module for doing hospitalization that is age-based. Then I also have these, these are some of our other behaviors. I have them down here because these modules all talk to each other and inform each other. Um, these ones are all standalones and I um, have a social distancing module. Some agents decide to pull themselves out of their, um, their neighborhood. Uh, and I use observed data to actually from North Carolina to assign that behavior. I have mask wearing, some agents wear masks, some don't. Um, some can work from home. Um, I have a module to close schools and I also have a module that um, North Carolina actually has like 8% of all kids are homeschooled in North Carolina. It's like this massive homeschooling population that I didn't know about until I started doing this model. So I wrote a little homeschool um, module, which basically takes 8% of the kids who are in the schools in the data and says, you actually don't go, you, you interact in your neighborhood and you interact at your home, but you don't go and interact at school. So kind of cool stuff. It's big. All of these are pretty crazy. This is what um, what's called a state diagram for the model. I'm not going to go through all of it. I'm just going to show you kind of what it looks like. In this case, I have agents who are susceptible to infection. They can be exposed. They That little orange thing is a, a length of time that they... Uh, uh, which is drawn out of a, a distribution, how long they stay in that state. There are probabilities based on age, whether that agent becomes asymptomatic, symptomatic, or severely symptomatic. And then symptomatic or symptomat asymptomatic agents just go to recover, whereas people who are severely symptomatic get hospitalized, stay there for a certain amount of time, determined by this module, and then they are either deceased or go to recover. And then at some point, some of the agents go back susceptible cool uh, I'll take uh, questions at the end um, so so this is a it's it's set up like a SEIR uh, epi model but it is in the agent based um, uh, uh, paradigm so an example then of a different type one of these behavior ones is like my testing module right where People are eligible for testing based on their infection status, whereas people who are symptomatic with COVID are more likely to be um, tested than someone who is like just um, susceptible to COVID. There's a time since exposure that determines whether they test positive or negative. I wrote a little um, two states in here for so I can delay from like when you take the test and when people actually get the test results back. Because I was thinking I'm doing the early part of the pandemic. So it was like PCR tests when it took us a couple of days, you'd go get swabbed and then you'd find out. Um, and then after you have a test, you go back here and it determines where you go next. This also links in like with the isolation module. So if you receive a positive COVID test, in my model, you're, you have a probability of, deter, of deciding you're going to isolate. So this is, again, a big laundry list of the different parameters that I've gotten either from the literature or from other models that I use to, to basically um, uh, to prep my model. Some of the things that I'm doing that's a little different is I, we actually have like observed data, right? About like how many schools were closed and when they closed down in North Carolina. So I actually like, this is observed data and workplaces closed, I have some data. So I have some observed data. I have observed data about the proportion of people in the state that were wearing masks at any day. So I actually was able to do this in a way that's pretty fun because I have, you know, time series data about proportion of people wearing masks in the state and I can assign agents those behaviors. And then I can look and see, how did I do, right? This is another issue that we're having with COVID is that this is estimated infections, new daily infections. Um, the black line looks very much like a mathematically produced line. And that's because it is, because we don't actually have measurements. We don't have observed data on, who, on infections. We have cases and those are infections sometimes fault, uh, but those are infections who have gone through the testing process and have been reported to the state government or whoever. Um, so this is a, the black line is another model I built during early parts of COVID uh, that estimates infections. And you can see 
because the agent based model has this stochasticity built into it, right? You can see I get a range of outcomes in and around kind of what we would expect for the early part of the pandemic from January of 2020 to, to November of 2020. So this is where I was also thinking about, well, we do have observ observed data on new daily cases. And this is how I tried to figure out if my testing, if my infections were correctly and maybe my ideas about testing were correctly, were correct. And you can see I'm overestimating the number of cases by a little bit here in the early pandemic, but I'm getting the number of reported cases pretty close. And then also um, this is the number of tests performed again, through this first part of the pandemic. And this is the proportion of tests that come back positive. I'm doing a pretty good job on that too. So it's this is one of the fun things about doing models like this with there's no ground truth. And my, my student, uh, Rachel, is has a paper out about this where we're testing FID and C versus a whole bunch of different type of ways of estimating infections just to see, like, is it in and around all of them because there is no ground truth. I joke about this. I say my model could be perfect. Like you can't say that my model is perfect. They're not perfect. Like um, it could be. So uh, we're also doing this geographically. I, I would have to turn in my geographer card if my presentation didn't have a map in it. Um, so this is a uh, count of infections by county in North Carolina. And these were a couple of the test sets that Rachel was was looking at. We have um, one from the DHHS test data that we get from the state of North Carolina and one that we did some estimates from John Hopkins uh, death data. And so you can see we're kind of in and around it. The magnitude's a little off here. I'm I actually I struck I like my model so much I actually believe it's more accurate than these two. Um, but we're thinking about this not just at a state level, but spatially, like how are we doing spatially at some of these different scales? And so we're doing some things like just correlation, like we may be off on magnitude on some of these places, but we're doing things like looking at correlation over time in these different counties in North Carolina. And you can see anything that's in the bluish or greenish color is, is moderate to high correlation. And so for a lot of counties, even though our magnitude may be off, we're at least capturing the general nature of, of infections as it went over time. Um, and then we have some other, this is the root mean squared error, and that's a daily measure um, and, and some like uh, infection weighted RMSC. So it's like the proportion that our error was of the daily cases. And what you're seeing here is a lot of small counties in North Carolina that our, our count error is not very high, but given their small populations, our, our percent error can be kind of high. But even with seeing this, knowing all the limitations of everything going here, I think this is an acceptable reconstruction of the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there is no ground truth. So it's hard to really say the model seems to have all the right parts in it and looks right. Um, I have not written a vaccine module yet. That's literally the first thing I'm working on when I get back from this trip. Um, and I'm still working on some geographic and spatial assignment of, of the um, attributes and behaviors because right now a lot of it just happens at the state level. So that's my model. Now I'm going to talk for a little bit. Oh, the last thing that Rachel's been working on. Um, these are also scenarios of like, what if we didn't mask in North Carolina? Or what if we didn't social distance? Or what if we didn't close the schools? Um, and that's one of the things we can use this type of model for because we can change those behaviors and assign it as a behavior. Um, then we can do these scenarios. You can see a lot of them were about like, what if we would have masked earlier or what if we would have had more people mask faster or social distance faster? So just quick thing there. So the second part is about estimating interactions. And this is uh, some fun work because again, with something like COVID, you actually have to have people in the same physical proximity for transmission to occur, even if it's indirect. I mean, I remember we were, everyone was wiping groceries. Remember that in March of 2020? I don't know if you were, I was wiping groceries like a, like everyone else uh, or like a lot of other people. Um, but this idea that, you know, these things are by transmitted by people who are close proximity to each other, there's nothing more graphic than that, right? That they have to share geography and space. 
Um, and so I really started thinking about contact patterns and how we, as geographers, and I think a lot of people assume that distance between residents or distance among people is the main driver or determinant of who you come into contact with. I think that most of us would probably think that I spend most of my time with people that live in and around me. Um, right. So I wanted to actually interrogate that. And so I I used mobility data, and this is one of those big companies called SafeGraph that that makes all the, that basically um, takes data from any of your apps or for some of your apps that track location. Um, I don't know which one they're like very close to the vest on which apps they use, um, but then they provide the data for researchers for free um, at a moderate spatial resolution. So block group is the data size I work census block group uh, for large geographic regions like the whole state of North Carolina. It's actually available for all of um, the US and some of Canada. And what this is really great for is because it allows us to actually estimate and model interactions between people who live in different places based on some kind of observed data rather than just assuming it's spatial. Um, so I use the two pieces of data from here, which is the number of devices that leave home every day. And I just wanted to show you what this looks like. So this is in the US, this is January through March of 2020. And then you can see that um, it was about 25% of all people uh, stayed home all day, every day. And as the pandemic came, it, that got up into like 45% of all people. So this is one um, part of the data I use. And then the other part is this really cool thing, which is about the devices that are visiting points of interest, which are like retail locations, restaurants, workplaces, businesses. And SafeGraph gives you data aggregated by block group and point of interest at a monthly scale. So like, if you think about this, it's like a big origin destination matrix. It's the number of devices says at this point of interest who reside in this block group in this month, right? So it's a count, it's actually a number. Um, and this data is what I'm using to construct what's called a bipartite network. And it's a special type of network where we have basically two different kinds of sets of nodes and one are like the origins and another a set of destinations. And the nodes themselves, these origins, they don't connect to each other. They only connect to each other via these connections and destinations. So what I do is I can set this up so such that this set of nodes here may be my block groups. These are my points of interest. And then the edges are the number of people who live here or devices that visited here. We can take that network and do what's called a one mode projection. And we can look at how much overlap there are of people that live in these different places based on shared locations, okay? So this is really cool because um, you guys basically can take this, you know, messy set of information and break it down into something kind of usable. Um, and so what I did was I looked at these interactions and I checked it out over a whole year. So I aggregated everything over a whole year prior to the pandemic because I just kind of wanted to see what the baseline was. And then I said, oh, well, we also know how to assign neighbors based on geography. That's easy. Like, I, I do that all the time. So I was looking at the proportion of interactions that actually happen with your geographic neighbors, right? So I've got these interactions from the, the, the visits, um, and I can then, like, map that out by geography. So an example is, like, these green polygons are um, what are called, like, first-order neighbors, and then in this case, I have first order neighbors and then second order neighbors because the, the neighbors of the neighbors. And I looked at these different lags, okay? So this is kind of cool because here, oh, so so what this would look like. So this is a, another like small example just to show you what this looks like. So here are our block groups by the home. Here are the, the points of interest, right? And then, so you can see things like, Maybe A, B, A and B are near each other geographically, but no one from A and B go to the same place, right? And so in this case, A and B, when we turn this into a network, they're not 
uh, they're not connected, whereas there's a lot of interaction between B and C because there are two people here and three people here, okay? So I'm doing that, but then I'm using this concept of geography to map it back into like geographic space. And really interesting results that I thought were wrong. I rechecked them so many times. I had, like I did it. I had my grad students look at it or grad students and we're going to do it. But this is the result. So this is the percent of all estimated interactions by neighborhood lag. Okay. So the one here is that first ring of neighbors around every block group. And that's what you can see are, these are 6,000 block groups and this is the state average of North Carolina. So what you can see is that first lag is only about 6% of all interactions that people would have in these points of interest are with residents of that first ring. Slightly higher, 10-ish percent, residents of that second ring. Even slightly higher than that is that is a third ring of neighbors around. I'm like, why? How does this work? Why? It's just like my geographer brain was literally like melting out of my ears. And because this is like against geography, right? Like my geography brain was telling me this should be really high and it should, you know, go like this. So then we started thinking, well, let's think about how neighborhoods are actually built and why we might be seeing this after I picked up my brain, put it back in. So think about how many green polygons are here versus how many of these orange polygons are here. So this is when I was like, ah, there it is. There's actually a lot more potential people to interact with in that second ring around every place. And there's even more potential people to interact with in that third ring. And so what you see is then I can map the number of people in each of these rings and the number of neighbors in each of these rings. And you can see it just goes up, 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 right? So there's more people. And then when you actually account for that, so it's like the intensity of interactions at different regions, um, you would see that then to divide the number of interactions by the potential number of people, then you get this thing that makes my geographer brain not melt and you get this decreasing function, right? Where on a per person basis, we're more likely to interact with our nearest neighbors um, uh, than you know, people two, two rings out, three legs out. Uh, and so, but this, this, I made this basically just to like satisfy anyone that's like, your results are wrong, but this is actually epidemiologically, this is what's important. You know, it's these connections right here, it's not about intensity of connection. Like it doesn't matter if you run into one out of the two people that live next door in the, the place next door. It's like if you're running into 10 people um, who live a little further away, that's a much more important for your potential infection transmission. So I also have been thinking about scale. I did this at a tract level, um, which are slightly bigger than block groups. And you can see instead of getting a, pat, uh, a peak at the, the third ring, we get this peak at the second ring which makes a lot of sense, right? Because tracks are a little bigger. These are probably actually the same neighbors about this place as the, the block group peak. So, so very similar results at the track level. I'm going to look at the county because I think some funky stuff might start happening at a county in North Carolina. But in general, I found that we interact with people that live near us. I think this is a semi-novel way to think about how to define contacts for these type of models. Um, and especially for geographers who have been kind of stuck in space, um, we often default to like first order neighbors when really it might be these second, third order neighbors that are more important for understanding infection transmission. Um, and then thinking about, well, what does actually mean this, this difference between potential interactions versus uh, intensity of interaction? So I've been trying to use this data to make um, epidemiologically relevant herds. And what I mean by that is I'm thinking about that, that a herd is likely some group of people who are strongly connected with each other, but not strongly connected with people outside of their herd. And um, 
And basically, we can use that network that I showed you, because it's literally strength of connections, and community detection algorithms to start sectioning places into herds that they might not be geographically contiguous, right? But they have these strong connections via our network. And so I'm using this data to start constructing herds. I'm using network-based community detection um, algorithms. I'm using the walk trap one, which just because I'm, I'm, that's the one that uh, I started with to then uh, section all the block groups in North Carolina into, um, in this place, in this case, 100 herds, because we have 100 counties, and I wanted to just do a comparison. Um, and you can see we get a lot different results. The geography of these connections are a lot different than the administrative geography of counties. We all, everyone probably in the room knows that often our public health interventions, our public health monitoring, surveillance is county-based. Um, and so this is where I was talking about like, you know, thinking about this, what is the relevance of herds to public health? You know, this geography of connectivity is a lot different than, than this one. Um, and thinking about how to rectify that and what that means. So that's one of the things I'm working on right now. This should, I believe, oh, this is the PDF version. This was a, a, a animation to show you how this changed over time, but it's too much information anyways. Uh, last part is hurting me. I'm going to wrap up right here. Um, that that is the future work. This is the end of where I've gotten done at this point. Um, I'm currently using the the sit and see model uh, to simulate some kind of like uh, basically uncontrolled COVID outbreaks. Like, what if we wouldn't have done anything um, such that I can actually get like this herd immunity response? Because with public health interventions. Um, kind of changes the level of transmission. And so studying herd immunity is much more difficult because it's like, you know, kind of this wandering curve of how we're moving up to um, that level. And part of the reason this has been so hard is because the difference between um, when I propose this work for childhood vaccinations versus COVID, you know, childhood vaccines, even the kind of some of the worst schools or school districts are very, um, still have quite high uptake, you know, 70, 80%. Um, and, and so that range, you know, studying the difference between 80, 90, 95, 100%, a lot different than like zero to 100% starting COVID from like no immunity. So I've had to do a lot of like scrambling and thinking about how this model um, works. And also because I was thinking about something like measles, which needs like 95% coverage versus something like COVID, which is probably closer to 55 or so. Um, uh, I've had to, had to like change the way I think about the, the whole experiment. So that's it. Uh, this research was supported by my K award. Uh, and thanks to a whole bunch of uh, students I've been working with that have been helping me with, with all the data. Okay. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, for, for people who've been vaccinated and uh, yeah, so the way I'm going to write the model is that like you get vaccinated, but then there is only a proportion, then there there is a, um, a, a probability that you actually develop immunity. And I want to write it in a way that um, I think people start making different decisions once they're vaccinated too. And so I, I kind of want to have in there that there is like they may make different decisions, even if they're not immune. Um, but yeah, I think, and I think that's important. The other thing I don't have in the model is different strains. And, and, um, and so I can theoretically have different strains of the virus going in the model. I'm a little scared to tackle that um, right now. Um, but that's what, you know, we've seen a lot of the, the different strains then breaking through some of the earlier uh, vaccines. And the other thing I'm not 100% sure of how I'm going to do is the boosters. Um, I'm going to try to get try to get in the model. Um, like the first maybe half a year of the vaccination campaign done wherever before the boosters uh, uh, came out. I actually am lucky. I have I have the shot level, level database for all of North Carolina for all the COVID vaccination. Um, so I can actually see uh, 
when people got their series, when they got their first booster, when they got their second booster, and I can see what vaccine they got. So I, I think I want to integrate that, but I'm like, I literally, the vaccine module is the one that's, I've got it like sketched out a little bit right now, but I, I, um, that's what I'm working on next actually. I didn't actually, and that was, <laughs> there were I, like so many decisions because I've like all the, the amount of data that I've integrated into this, but I did, I like thought about it. I was like, oh, should I have it like less interaction at this place because it's a massive like department store or something versus a small area? Cause it's in there, it's in there. I just, ultimately I decided not to because I thought the assumption that people are spending the time in a large building more spread out is, I don't know if that's any more of an assumption than they're just together in the, the bill. You know what I mean? That, that we can't differentiate that. Um, but yeah, I thought about it. The other thing that I, that I came to is like, uh, uh, Kelsey and Hannah are like working so hard with me on this. Like we're really trying to, so we have a paper that hasn't been submitted yet. That is, that's basically these results and this approach. And we're, we're struggling with kind of how to make this math make sense to people who are not mathematicians or, you know, who aren't like, like I'm not a mathematician, but my head is like inside of these calculations. And I understand why the numbers come out the way they do because, um, because we think that this idea of potential interactions is pretty powerful, right? Like, you know, we don't know if this person and these people ever interacted or ever shared space in that point of interest. But we do know that at some point in time, they were at that place and they, this, you know, these other people were at that place. And in this case, this comes out to be a six because it's like, you can think of it as two potential interactions for every one of these three people or three potential interactions for each of these. The numbers start getting big real, really quickly. Um, and so uh, that's another thing we've been thinking about is kind of how to take that, that mathematical output from the network analysis and make it tangible and make it like something that people can get behind. Um, so yeah, that's, if anyone has ideas, we're trying, we're doing diagrams. This is the last diagram we, we uh, landed on. And I felt like that one does a pretty good job because the numbers make sense. And then we even have like places that aren't connected in, in the network. Uh, but we've been really thinking about how to, how to take this idea um, and, you know, and just make it relevant and make it understandable in a way. I, I really like applied research. And so, um, you know, I, I want people to be able to use this uh, at some point. So I, yeah, and we spent a lot of time thinking about the, what the data actually is, because it's just devices and it's over a month and it could be, it could be literally one person making multiple trips every day for all month, or it could be, you know, 
a hundred people making one trip and they all kind of miss each other temporally. And, and from what I could tell, like, cause of the way SafeGraph aggregates the data, you have to give up the temporal resolution to get the spatial resolution, or you'd have to give up the spatial resolution to then get the daily data for the points of interest. Then you don't know um, who's there every day at that, that resolution, I think is the, the issue. Yeah, you don't know the home block group of people. But, but in general, you bring up a good point about this is that, yeah, not all potential interactions maybe you know, maybe the same. And I have to, you know, it's one of those things. This is the struggle. This has been the struggle with building the model. I mean, Molly and I talked about this. I said about doing a modeling environment. It's like, you know, it's where is the line between I could model that. I, I know how I could, you know what I mean? Like I could model that. Or is it like the whole, like, is, is the juice worth the squeeze on it? Like, is it, is it getting me any amount of certainty um, and I don't know. That's the thing that I think is, has been a little difficult for me is I, it's hard for me to understand what is worth it, um, which is why I've been taking, you know, I, I started working on this, um, boy, I think it's September of uh, 20, 2021. So, um, and we're, we got these results that Rachel's been working with this first set about three or four months ago. And so it's, it's taken a good, good amount of time even to get it up and going. And yeah. It is, it's quite my, <laughs> I like the idea though, right? I, I mean, that's, it, it, it opens up all this additional analysis and thinking about it, we can do. And it's like, it opens up all these minefields because it's like, oh, well, I don't know if any, you, you know, at C, given the data I'm using, you know, at, or at that place right there, those people never could have actually ever shared physical space with each other. But yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I do, I do. Very much so. I, I think in, in this type of work, it's like, you know, I, I'm probably, I'm definitely not capturing that, right? Um, that, and that's, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things that we're not doing here is there's, and because there's limited data about like local policies and like local mask mandates and things like that. And I, I do have some data about like for North Carolina at like, it's, it's the Metro counties and then the rural regions. So it's, it's only, I think like eight observations, but it's all the masking data broken down, not by state, but by these different geographies. Um, I'm actually working with another student because this model is built in C++ and I cannot do that like I can't get my head wrapped around that um so he's helping me to try to actually be able to do some local type things because again like I live in the triangle bubble where everyone was masked for a long time and like it looked a lot different than when I went out to the mountains early in the pandemic you know there I didn't see a mat we didn't see a mask for a week you know and and so right now the model's not set up like that I want to do some of it 
I, I will do some of it. It's just like how to. Yeah. Yep. I have that data too. And I had a student try to look at it on a summer reach internship and she couldn't like quite get through it. And I just didn't have the time, but we actually looked at tourism, vaccine tourism in North Carolina because we have the residence location. We have the zip code of where they got uh, vaccinated and you could definitely see the triangle effect, like literally people. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Thank you though. It's like, yeah, it's, 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 work in progress and and I, i'm grappling with these questions about like when is it done and when when should it be done and is it ever done and and um and how do i make it better oh. and i i think i saw was there one back there yeah It's not, and uh, and I actually have some colleagues. He's, I think he's at Simon Fraser, and he does some transit modeling, like like what's the likelihood that people are like given different destinations um, that they come into contact with each other. This doesn't have public transit in it, and I'm sad, but also like, goodness, we're so bad at collecting data. It was like I wouldn't even know how to like integrate that in, right? Like. I don't know, like, if I could estimate how many people are on the bus, and in, 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 and it's a bummer because it's like that is something modelable, right? Like, I could, everyone in my model goes to work, and it models them as being in a place, and I could add a place called the bus that some people spend thirty minutes on a day, and we pick them out of the population and we put them on the bus together. Um, yeah, the 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 data hungry nature of this is. Um, has been a little difficult to grapple with and I can't even, and I love data and I like swim in data. And I like, since, since I became a researcher, I like love working with these ridiculous data sets. Um, and so it's, even for me, if I feel like even when I'm starting to be like, wow, this is, this is a data hungry thing, then it's really getting to a place that that's kind of hard for me to fathom, like, you know, where else to go or what to do with it. So, uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So right now it is your symptom uh, status is based just on your age when you get infected um, in the model. I don't have vaccination in there yet. And I'm thinking that when I do vaccination, I might have to reconsider this to put some people who would have been severely symptomatic had they not been vaccinated just into infectious uh, because we do know that there are breakthrough cases and we do know that that it's not an all or nothing type effect with vaccination. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, and I'm wondering about that, like how I'm gonna do it. But the nice thing is like with the hospitalization module that I have, like it talks to the, the SARS module, right? And so I could have a vaccination module that like talks to this module and they can communicate with each other and it'll know to send someone who'd normally be severe it can kind of maybe get filtered through the vaccine module. So, yeah. You know, and the funny thing is, I am prepared for that question because we we just talked, uh, and my my scientist wife uh, that was I showed her some of this stuff. She's like, "Do you do comorbidities?" That's literally her first question about it. Um, I would love to. I I wonder about how to do it in the model. Like, I have a synthetic population. Everyone has an age and a race and a uh, and live in a place. I think I could do it. Um, but I again, I'm thinking about data. 
in how to assign the comorbidities to the synthetic population without having to go through sift through 10 million people and do it in a way that makes sense, right? And that is like defensible um, when I'm already kind of feel like I'm trying to defend a lot. But again, I would, I want to, but I, right now I'm thinking broad strokes, right? Because age is probably the one that, um, the best for this. So yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, that's what some of the thing I've been grappling with is is this thinking that I want to be both an epidemiologist and a public health person outside of being a geographer of like, who is this for? Is it just for me? Is it for decision making? Is it for, um, it, the funny thing is I joke about it. Like, like one of my uh, PhD students, who they might say like, Oh, what about this? I'm like, Whoa, we got to make sure this model doesn't get too out outlandish, but then something else I get super interested in. They're like, what about this? I'm like, that is a great idea. Like, <laughs> So it's right now it's as parsimonious as I'm willing to deal with <laughs> at, at that time when, when something gets brought up, but, but yeah, it's a lot of it is I think about, I've been thinking about how to, what can I parameterize and what could I like, will it make any real, like, out, do I think it's actually going to like really change the output? Is this something that's going to really, really change it? Honestly, something about like comorbidities probably would. It's probably some way I could get some geography implemented in this without actually having to explicitly assign spatially um, attributes. So, yeah, that's great. I, you know, thoughts though. Oh, we're 130. Oh my gosh.